Well, we're starting this morning um, an Advent Christmas series. Um, Advent may not be a word that you're familiar with. I know that I certainly wasn't coming out of the evangelical circles, but Advent is a very common theme, especially among Catholics. Um, because they follow the Christian calendar very specifically. But Advent begins this week and begins to turn our attention towards the birth of Jesus. And Advent is the tension of waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled. And Advent reminds us that God is faithful to fulfill his word, but there is also a season of waiting for that fulfillment. And so the birth of Jesus is a, a reminder for us that he promised the coming of Jesus back in Genesis and how many hundreds and hundreds of years passed before Jesus actually appeared here on earth and even though some people were losing hope the prophets continue to point towards the Messiah and so as we celebrate as we transition out of this time of Thanksgiving we celebrate the season of Advent we are celebrating the fact that not only did Jesus come once and God is faithful to his word but that Jesus will come again amen um, and I don't know about you, but the enemy will often creep up into my little brain and start to whisper things like, he's not really coming. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you ever have that conversation where it just seems like, okay, maybe this is just like, it's like fairy tale, you know? And, and it just seems like the longer that we wait, the more that people are falling away, the, the faith is getting harder to stay in. And, and it was the same way before Jesus came that people were losing hope, the people of God were losing hope. They had been exiled to Babylon, and here these prophets are talking about the Messiah's coming to save us, and they're probably going, yeah, right, we've been waiting for hundreds of years for this Messiah, and we haven't seen him, he's probably not coming. We've got to be careful, church, that we're not lulled into the same trap, that we're not lulled to sleep as we wait, but that we stay attentive, that we stay expectant, that we remember that Jesus is, is returning as he has promised he came once he will come again and although we wait god is always faithful to fulfill his promises and so how that encourages us during the season is what are you waiting on that god has promised you what are you waiting on for to be fulfilled and are you staying in a place of expectancy or have you lost hope We've, we're reminded that god is faithful to his word during this advent season amen let's start by reading john 1 through uh, chapter 1, 1 through 18. It says this In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Hallelujah. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart, and he has revealed God to us. Now, just an overview, the scope and the design of this chapter is to confirm our faith in Christ as the eternal Son of God, 
the true Messiah, Savior of the world, that we might be brought to receive him, rely upon him as our prophet, priest, and king, and to give up ourselves to be ruled and taught and saved by him. A well-known commentator rightly surmised that the first few verses of this chapter should be written in letters of gold, and I couldn't agree more. I think that this is one of the most just incredible chapters written in the Bible. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. Those are some of the most substantial statements of our faith that we can come into contact with during this Advent season. So we have the announcement of the Messiah here. The fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah is here in John's beautiful words that are written. And so in this Advent season, we take time to remember the birth of our Savior, Jesus. We remember the fact that his arrival was promised, and this chapter solidifies that the promise was true. We remember his work of redemption was promised. Back in Genesis, remember God told uh, the enemy, he said that you will bruise his hill, but her seed will crush your head, right? So back in Genesis, we had the promise of the plan of redemption, and we see in this that this chapter solidifies that that promise came true. We remember he promised he would rise again. He fulfilled that promise. We remember that he promised the Holy Spirit, and he has fulfilled that promise. Advent season also reminds us that he promises he will return soon, and based upon his track record, he will fulfill that promise too. Amen? Advent season reminds us that God is faithful to his word. Full stop, end of sentence, that's all that we need to know this morning, is that Advent season reminds us that God is faithful to his word. Advent season celebrates both the waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises and the glory of God's promises fulfilled. Hallelujah. Advent season reminds us that though we may wait, God always, someone say always, fulfills His promises. Advent is the celebration of fulfilled promises. It is the celebration of the fulfillment of God's Word. Hallelujah. This should bring excitement to your soul because I know that many of you are believing for things in your life. You're holding on to promises of God. I am continuously, always holding on to the promise that God has given me in place in my heart. And though we may tarry and wait for it, He will bring it to fulfillment. So the question is, for you this Advent season, is who, or better yet, what are you celebrating? Advent is not only just the celebration of Jesus' birth, it's the celebration of God's faithfulness to his word. We should be encouraged during this Advent season as we hurry and run around and try to get things done and go from party to party and buy gifts and all that type of thing that God has promised to fulfill his word in your life, in our lives, for our church, for this world, for this nation. Amen. So what or who... Are you celebrating this Christmas season? Well, in this Advent season, we celebrate the Word, capital W. Well, what is the Word? Well, the Chaldean, the Chaldean paraphrase very frequently calls the Messiah Memra, M-E-M-R-A. It the, means the Word of Jehovah and speaks of many things in the Old Testament said to be done by the Lord as done by that Word of the Lord. Word here is twofold. It, it, first word is logos, and it means word conceived, right? Logos indiathetos. I'm not going to try to say that right, but you get the point. It means word conceived. The second part of it is logos prof, proferikos, which means word uttered, right? So the birth of Christ, if we translate that, in the beginning was the word, John announcing that the word has arrived in Christ, then the birth of Christ is the word of God conceived and the word of God uttered to his creation. There is the word conceived that means thought, which is the first and only immediate product and conception of the soul. 
All right, so let me explain this for a minute. You think before you do. Your thought life produces what happens externally. Amen? Right? It's conceived within you, and then it is brought into the external, right? It happens here only, and only you know that thought. Nobody else can know it quite like you know it, and it comes from within. And so if we look at that in regards to Christ, then we see that Jesus is fitly called the Word, the conceived Word, for He is the first begotten of the Father, that eternal essential wisdom which the Lord possessed as the soul does its thought in the beginning of his way. In other words, Jesus is the manifestation of the internal of the Father. Jesus, or God thought and Jesus showed up. Think about that for a minute. It is the expression of who he is externally. Oh, this is so good. It gets me all geeked out. All operations of which are performed by thought, and it is one with the soul. And so you see that although, we're going to get into this in just a little bit, although Jesus is outside of God, he is one with God. He has been conceived from God. He is the first begotten of the Father. So before anything else existed, Jesus was. Where did Jesus come from? The internal being, the thought process of the Father. So as we look at Jesus, we see the internal workings of the Father. This word uttered, uh, it is speech and chief and most natural indication of the mind. And thus Christ is the word and God has directed us to hear him. As it says in Matthew 17, 5, this is my beloved son, hear him. And through his life, He, Christ, has made known God's mind to us. He has revealed the life and the mind of God to us. Therefore, Christ is the wonderful speaker. He is the speaker of God's will for men and the reflection of his glory. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So now all of a sudden, Emmanuel takes on a much deeper meaning when we begin to understand what the word is because it is an outward expression, an outward demonstration of the Father here with us. Now the great thing is, so is the Holy Spirit. And even though Jesus isn't with us in the flesh anymore, the Holy Spirit is. And so therefore, we still have Emmanuel, God, with us. Amen. Hebrews 1.3 says, The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. So people might ask, well, what's God's will? Look at Jesus' life. And you'll discover what God's will is because Jesus is the expression. It is His character demonstrated to us. Amen. So people ask, well, does God really want to heal people? Well, Jesus healed people. So I believe that God wants to heal people, right? Does God love sinners? Well, Jesus loves sinners. So I believe that God loves sinners. Amen. If we just go through the life of Jesus and we look at how he behaved, the words that he said, we come into contact with the Father. And so this Advent season, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we celebrate the fact that God has deposited himself into this world, has become a participant in the sanctification and the glorification of his people. Amen. Christ the Word, being the Word, he is the truth, he is the amen, he is the faithful witness of the mind of God. We celebrate Advent this year because it reminds us that God can be known. We can know Jesus by what we read in the Gospels. We have the promise and the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we can know God. Some of you need to know that today. You're not in a place in your walk where you feel like that you can know him and know him personally. You can know God just as well as you know your husband, your wife, your daughters, your sons. Come on now. You can know him. You understand his presence. He has made that available to us. Hallelujah. What is the word? He always was. In the beginning, the word, what? Already existed. The word was with God. And the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. 
God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word always was. Proverbs 8.22 says, The Lord formed me from the beginning. Before he created anything else, I was appointed in ages past at the very first before the earth began. The world is from the beginning, but the word was in the beginning. The word had a being before the world had a beginning. Amen. Dude, that's awesome. So when Jesus shows up in the manger, this is not his first time. He's been around for a very, very, very long time. He always was. Amen. This speaks of his existence not only before his birth, but before all time. The beginning of time. Now, this is stuff that makes your mind go, like, hurt. Like, your brain starts to hurt, right? Like, Addison was talking to me about this the other day. He goes, you ever think about that, like, nobody made God? And I said, yeah. And he goes, does that hurt your brain? I was like, yeah, it hurts my brain. Because we are, right, finite beings at this point. We have a beginning and we have an end. Everything is measured by beginning and end, right? I mean, you go to a tombstone, it says like 1974 through 19-something, and your whole life is represented by that little dash, right? Okay, everything that you did is right in that little dash. But you can be outside of it and see the beginning and the end. So it makes our brain begin to cramp up when we think, he just always was. Well, that's freaking me out but it's because we are finite in our existence and he is infinite in his. He that was in the beginning never began and therefore was ever eternal, a chronos without being of time. We celebrate Advent because it reminds us that Jesus was always the plan. Always. His redemption is as faithful as the creation of man. The redemption plan of Christ was grafted into the very foundations of creation. Therefore, the promises of Christ are as faithful as the air we breathe because it is a part of the earth's design. We'll get into that more in a minute. The word coexisted and exists with the Father. We see here it says that he was, the word was with God and the word was God. Well, that's an interesting statement, but it means that the very same word that we believe in and preach and speak out was in the beginning with God. That is, he was so from eternity. In the beginning, the world was from God, but the word was already with God, as ever with him, which tells us a few things about Jesus, about the word. In respect of his essence and substance, the word was God a distinct person or substance, for he was with God, and yet in the same substance, for he was God. See, again, this is going to make our brains cramp, but it's awesome. So when we say that Jesus was with God and that he was God, we have a separate being from God, but we have the same in spirit as he is God. Does that make sense? Some of you are like, eh, maybe. Maybe. So, in respect of essence and substance, he was a distinct person from God, but he is also in the same substance, for he is God. Number two, in respect of father and son relationship, there was a glory and a happiness that Christ had with God before the world was. I think this is the neatest thing to think about. That there is a father-son relationship between Jesus and the Father. John 17, 5, Jesus prayed, Now, Father... Bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. The son, infinitely happy in the enjoyment of his father's bosom, and no less the father's delight, the son of his love, as it says in Proverbs 8.30, 8.30, I was the architect at his side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence. I love that that we begin to think about that Jesus and the Father have this relationship that we aren't privileged to, that there are father-son things happening there. I love that prayer where Jesus says, bring me back into that same glory that we shared before the foundations of the earth began, that there is a special relationship, a connection between the Father and the Son. In respect of counsel and design, The mystery of man's redemption by this word, Jesus, was hid in God before all worlds. 
As Paul said in Ephesians 3.9, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. He that undertook to bring us to God, which is Jesus, was himself from eternity with God. So that this plan of reconciliation to God was co-designed by the Father and the Son from eternity, and they understand one another perfectly in it. Oh, I'm, I'm liking this a lot more than you guys are. It's all good. I'll preach myself happy. He that undertook to bring us to God was himself with, from eternity with God. So this plan of reconciliation was co-designed between God and the Father or between Jesus and the Father. I love that. So before the foundations of the earth were laid, it wasn't like Adam and Eve messed up, and God looks at Jesus and goes, now what do we do? That's not what happened. The design of the earth was implemented with the fact that Jesus would always be the plan of redemption for man. That's great news for me, because it means I trust in something that wasn't because of a mistake. It was always the foundation of this earth that this earth wouldn't rotate without the redemptive plan of Jesus Christ. It would break and fall apart. It couldn't stand it. It couldn't exist under the weight of sin. No, it was designed with the mistake of Adam and Eve implemented into it so that Jesus could come and save us from being one decision away from isolation from God for the rest of our lives. Because that's what sin is. Sin is isolation from the Father. He can have no part of it. And so God couldn't have a creation that at all times was with one, one failure of temptation. Look, I failed five times on the way to church. I got mad at the guy driving in front of me. He's going 35 on gun club. Get out of the way. Right then, isolation from God. I mean, right? I mean, we are, we are such frail and weak beings that it wasn't like, okay, we're going to throw Adam and Eve out here and see how this works. No, Jesus was with God as they were designing it as co-architects, and Jesus said, I'll go and die. I'll go and die. He stepped forward. He volunteered. He designed this from the beginning. Well, why would he do that? Because he loves you. He loves me. He loves us. He loves his church. He loves his people. Amen. Matthew 11, 27 says this, My Father has entrusted everything to me, No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. We celebrate Advent because God has chosen to reveal Himself to us. So you think that it all started with you responding to an altar call at a church one Sunday. Right? Like all of a sudden you just came to this glorious place of salvation because you're wonderful. No, you're a scum of the earth. I'm a scum of the earth. We are all sinful and broken. The only reason that you know God is because he decided to show up in the spirit and preach to your heart on that Sunday morning or that Wednesday night or whenever it was and reveal his glory unto you. Now that gets me excited because, man, I'm so fortunate. I am so blessed that the God of the universe, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has unlocked my heart to the saving grace of Jesus Christ because it has radically changed my life, changed my marriage, it has changed my future, it has changed everything about me. And I mourn for those who have not shared the same experience. And I pray that God would choose to reveal himself to them. This always points us back to his lordship, which brings great peace and comfort. Because we begin to think that the world is out of control based on all of mankind's decisions when God is up there watching and lording over all, using his church, his people, to bring his glory into this earth. Hallelujah. We celebrate Advent because God has chosen to reveal himself to us. So we see that he existed with God from the beginning. We also see that all things were made by him. He was with God, not only so as to be acquainted with the divine counsels from eternity, but was in the divine operations from the beginning of time. Psalms 33, 6 through 9 says, The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word. He breathed Jesus. And all the stars were born. 
He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. And it appeared at his command. God made the world by a word and Christ was the word by him, not as a subordinate instrument, but as a coordinate agent. God made the world with Jesus. Not as the workman cuts by his axe was God using Jesus, but as the body sees by the eye was God working with Jesus. Amen? Without him was not anything made that was made. God the Father did nothing without the word in that work. Now this chapter really begins to jump off the page when you go back to Genesis chapters 1. And two, you should go back and read that because you begin to realize the coordination between the Spirit, the Son, and the Father in the beginning of this earth. And we see that the manifestation of, of everything that life came through is now being delivered like a baby into the manger. Hmm. God made, I already said that, when we worship Christ, we worship him to whom the patriarchs gave honor as the creator of the world and on whom all creatures depend. This shows how well qualified he was for the work of our redemption and salvation. Why? Because he was the engineer. Help was laid upon one that was mighty indeed, for it was laid upon him that made all things, and he has appointed the author of our bliss, who was the author of our being. The one who has made us has saved us. And there is no one more qualified for the work. So end this Advent season as we prepare to receive communion this morning. We celebrate the Word, capital W. Christ, the Word speaking from God to us and to God for us. This reminds us and tells us that the Word can be known. 1 John 1, 1 through 2 says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so this is John talking here. And the same one who wrote this in the beginning was the Word. He is telling you that I know this Word because I have seen him. I have handled him i have touched him i have heard his voice i've hung out with him by the fire you know i mean you understand that he is trying to reveal to you it's just like if you'd never met addison i will tell you no addison exists well how do you know because i've touched him i've hugged him i understand i know he's there i and i would be relating to his characteristics that's what john was doing in first john one through two the word can be known church intimately Through the Holy Spirit, we can know the Father. We can know Jesus. We can know the Holy Spirit. Not in any judgmental way, but I can often tell how well people know the Father through their worship. And the reaction or lack thereof. Um, Because the reason that I always lift my hands when I worship, the reason that I'm always ready to jump down to the front of the altar, the reason that I always move myself away from the seat because I know his presence and I know what he can unfold into my life right here and right now. If I just give him 30 minutes of my undivided attention, he can absolutely rock my world. But so many Christians are so uninterested in tarrying in the presence of God because they don't know him. Thank you, Father. He just gave me a great illustration. It's like going out to coffee with somebody you've never met before. You ever done that? It is an awkward conversation. Right? It is. Because you're sitting there thinking of, well, where are we even beginning? You know, once you get past, well, what do you do? How many kids do you have? All that type of stuff. There's like this awkward silence of, all right, what do we do now? 
You know, I mean, you're looking for things to talk about because there is no commonality. There's no relationship. There hasn't been anything grown or established together. And that's what you're doing, obviously, in that first meeting. But the reason that a lot of Christians are uninterested in consuming themselves in corporate worship or even in private worship is because you don't know him, and so it's awkward. It feels weird. Well, why is Dan up there crying? And why are we just sitting here playing notes for 10 minutes? Let's sing another song. It's so uncomfortable. When I'm up here going, oh my gosh, the power and the presence of God is so strong. And he's downloading all these thoughts into my heart. And he's ministering. And he's speaking to me. He's changing my life. How we worship reveals how much we know him. We celebrate the word. And it reminds us that the word Jesus, he builds. He never tears down. He builds. Acts 20, 32 says, now, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. We see that the word empowers with grace. Hebrews four fifteen says, The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Tells us that the word sanctifies and knows us. He also works his power in us, and the word works his power through us. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. He knows us, church. Number five, the word is the returning king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, 11 through 16 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. This is who we celebrate this Advent season, church far greater than just a baby lying in a manger. We're talking about divinity coming down into mankind, visiting us with his miraculous power. Now let me just say this as a side note. I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to encourage you in this. If Jesus is the word, and this is the word of God, then this is what? It's not a trick question. Jesus, there you go. This is Jesus. So when we're instructed to speak forth the word, what are we doing? We're bringing Jesus into the circumstance. The problem is, as many of us have forgotten that we're called to use the word in this way. Many of us maybe don't know how to use the word in this way. We have got to, as mature Christians, grow into the place where we are effectively wielding the power and the word of God into our daily circumstances. Amen. Well, I just want to be well. Then insert Jesus into your health begin to proclaim the word of God over your healing and get vicious about it. Amen. Because this is the light. The light exposes the darkness. The darkness can never extinguish it. It's what we just read. 
You are bringing the blueprint of the foundation of the world into your circumstance when you begin to confess his word. Oh, that's good. We've got to use, learn to use the word as it was intended to be used. Continuous reminder of his faithfulness, the power of God inserted into our situations, into our circumstances. Well, my husband, you know, he just behaves like a little devil. Well, then begin to confess Jesus over him. Thank you, Michael. Right? My wife, she just doesn't honor me the way that she's supposed to, or she doesn't help me like she's supposed to, or whatever it is. She's always on my case. Well, then begin to confess Jesus over her. If you want to see something change, confess Jesus over her, because God knows you've already confessed your opinion all over him or her, right? Confess Jesus over them. Begin to speak the truth of God over them. I've shared this with you before. I will share it with you again because it is such a powerful illustration. I acted like a little devil until my wife began to tell me what I wasn't. Right to my face. The nerve of that woman. She would begin to speak Jesus over me, and not just over me behind my back, but over me in front of me. So I would be acting like a crazy man. She's, oh, you're just blessed of the Lord. You're a world changer. God's got his hand on you. I mean, she would be confessing the scripture of God. And it's amazing what happens in your life when someone begins to confess the word of God over you. Parents with your children, confess the word of God over them. Amen? When you're praying for their safety when they're away at school, don't just cross your fingers and just really, really hope. No, take out Jesus and say, no weapon formed against them will prosper. Come on now, confess Jesus over them and get into Psalms 91 and begin to confess the, the precious, saving grace, protection of our Lord and Savior over your children. Amen. Well, how do I do more of that? You've got to get in here and read it. And then you've got to begin to highlight stuff. I know that this is really practical, but I think someone needs to hear this this morning. So look, the stuff that I highlight is stuff that I'm trying to remember for my life things that affect me that I want to insert Jesus into. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. It's highlighted. Why is that highlighted? Because when I'm planting a church, I need to make sure that I'm on firm footing. I need to make sure that his gracious spirit is leading me. I want to do his will, not my will, right? Confess this type of stuff over yourself. Let me just read Psalms 91 to you. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. Hallelujah. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand may fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras, and you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. These are things that we should be confessing over ourselves, bringing Jesus into the situation, for this is Jesus. Come on now. Just a personal one for me. I love the last verse. I will reward them with a long life. That's something I'm believing for for myself. Well, why? Because every other Ingram dude has died at 60. Well, that seems like a long way away. Not for me. I'm 43. 17 years, church. Right? Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's insane. 
But all of them, my grandfather on both sides, they all died at like 62 years old. My dad died at 62. I'm not dying at 62. Well, where do you get off saying that? Because the Lord promises me, I will reward them with a long life. So I bring Jesus into my situation. I'm breaking that curse of all the Ingram dudes dying at 60. I'm not dying of heart failure. I'm not dying. Why? Because he heals all of my diseases. He heals all of my iniquities. Amen. His cross has crushed the head of the enemy. It no longer has any place in my life. These are the things that you need to begin to speak forth because Jesus is the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.